The history of science and medicine you were taught in school doesn't tell the whole story. Our legacy is full of unsung heroes who made incredible contributions that just haven't been recognized. And there are too many suppressed stories of exploitation under the guise of scientific research. As biomedical scientists and seekers of justice, we want to uncover the hidden side of science and make these stories known. People of all races, genders, nationalities, sexualities, and abilities have always been essential to pushing the field forward. It's time for us all to reclaim the bench. Hello, welcome to the second episode of Reclaim the Bench. I'm your co-host Jamal. And I'm Megan. First off, we'd like to say a huge thank you to everyone who's listened and provided feedback on our first episode. We're currently five stars on Apple, which we're really excited about. Whoop, whoop. How many reviews do we have? Five. Five five-star reviews. You know, to the five of you that did that, we super appreciate it. So thank you so much. But we had hundreds of downloads yeah. within the first week of episode one. I know. So, I mean, I thought maybe... Like some random people in our personal lives are going to listen to I it. I know. <laughs> and that was that. So if yeah. you like what you hear, let us know so we can be inspired to keep creating content. Yeah. And please share it with your friends and family and neighbors, anyone that you think might be interested in this. It, yeah. It's been really exciting to hear from all of you. So like Jamal said, just keep sending us your thoughts and ideas. So Megan, what can we expect from the episode today? So we're going to be learning about an American hero that you probably haven't heard of before. Actually, there's not even a picture of her that exists anywhere, which is crazy. But I'm going to call her the Notorious RLC in honor of a hero you probably have heard of, the Notorious RBG. So this week, when we're recording, um, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the trailblazing Supreme Court Justice, passed away last week on the eve of Rosh Hashanah. She was an unwavering defender of human rights and liberties, and she was also the first Jewish woman to serve on the U.S. Supreme Court beginning in the 1990s. Wow. Yeah, yeah. It took until the 1990s to get a Jewish woman on the Supreme Court, but I guess we're not very surprised. <laughs> no. And one tweet I saw from the author Ruth Franklin said that a person who dies on Rosh Hashanah is a, I'm probably going to say this wrong, but a Zadok or Zadok. Yeah, that's close. Yeah. Oh, yeah, you know. <laughs> I'm assuming you're close. <laughs> Rabbi Jamal knows. Yeah. So uh, Zadok is a person of great righteousness. So thank you, Ruth, for your incredible service. And we hope that she rests in peace. Yeah, that's so fitting. If anyone could be called a Sadiq, it seems <laughs> that it would be her. Um, and the person we're discussing today, while not Jewish, was also a person of great righteousness, right? Yeah, absolutely. So today, in contrast to last week, you'll learn about how medical school looked for women in the mid-1800s, and also what not to call a female doctor. You'll learn about the origin of historically black colleges and universities, the great betrayal of the 1860s, and why not to dunk a newly born baby into freezing cold water. And maybe while the notorious RLC should be the mother of gynecology. Oh yeah. And just a quick uh, thought about the audio quality. We're still working on figuring out the best place to record. So clearly the room we chose for this episode was not it, but we're aware and trying to improve. So, with that, let's get into it. Are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So, what's going on, Megan? Well, we just had this awesome sandwich that you shared with me. Yeah. you're the best friend ever. I know, I yeah. know. Yeah. That sub oil? <laughs> Clutch. I'll put you on to something. I know. Yeah, sub oil. <laughs> Stay away from the mayo. <laughs> yeah, no mayo. We are an anti-mayo podcast. Yeah, but we're not... We're, we're pretty split on some foods, like white nectarines oh my and white chili. All right. Uh, All right. Know, I'm, I'm just saying. 
I'm just saying. I didn't even like the white chili that much. <laughs> I just Good. had to try it. Good. Just leave chili the way it is. <laughs> All right, don't reinvent the wheel. Yes. <laughs> so it's Friday. How was your week? Oh, it felt very long. I don't even know what I did this week. What did we do this week? Uh, how was your research? Did you run some experiments? Oh, I did a lot of um, immunostaining, mm. which is when you're looking for us as neuroscientists, it's usually a slice of brain tissue. And then we're looking at the protein expression in the tissue. Jamal knows this, but for other people who don't, <laughs> <laughs> I do a lot of that. And some of them turned out well when I looked under the microscope, some did not. So a pretty typical week in science. <laughs> yeah, yeah. What magnification are you using? Uh, I was using a kind of low magnification. I think it was like 20x. Because okay. I was looking at just like overall levels. It's not acceptable by a PI. Yeah, I know. The you, RPI wants the very, the highest magnification. Yeah, so you better get it together. <laughs> I know. <laughs> How about you? As you know, I'm working on a manuscript right now. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, writing a paper which is called a meta-analysis study, which is where I'm taking a bunch of data, genomic data, digital data about genes and proteins and analyzing them using my own statistical methods to see if I can find some interesting things. And of course I did, which is like why I'm writing a paper now. So just in the process of preparing that draft and hope to have the draft completely done by this time next week. Nice. I know you've been working on it for a really long time. So yeah, it's a long process. It's a, it's definitely a process. Yeah. Yeah. And you learn how to be more organized with uh -huh. your tables and figures so that it's easy, more easy to access when you need it, when yeah. you need to reference it. So, uh, yeah, I know that's a thing for you, huh? Yeah, I'm optimizing <laughs> every day. Organization. Uh huh. You, you store all your files on the same, all your data on the same file sometimes. In my, in my mind, that's brilliant. You know, I can just pull up one file and it's like 6,000 tabs, but. Makes my makes my head hurt. For anybody listening out there that deals with big data, uh, maybe you know, but um, whenever I try to open that one Excel file, it could be up to 50 tabs with up to a million lines in each tab. And whenever I open a file, all my fans kick on on the laptop. You're making me break out in a cold sweat. <laughs> I hate this. <laughs> I can't tell you how many times Jamal has lost his data because of this. <laughs> yeah. Well, okay, we won't talk about that. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway but you're learning you know if we get interrupted during this recording it's because i forgot to reserve us a better room in the med school and right now we are in the library at the yeah. school we're and... breaking the law right yeah. now <laughs> so we're breaking the law for you guys <laughs> to serve you knowledge <laughs> so stay tuned hopefully we can finish this in one day <laughs> but we'll keep it recorded just in case yeah. you know the police come and harass us. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so what are we talking about today? All right. So today we have our first unsung hero, which I am very excited about. Instead of an oversung villain, mm. uh, Jamal, would you like to do the honors and introduce her? Yes, of course. So today we're talking about Rebecca Lee Crumpler. She's born Rebecca Davis on February eighth, eighteen thirty-one, and she was the first Black woman to earn an MD in the United States. Oh, yeah. Pretty awesome. And, of course, someone had to be first, but personally, after learning more about her, I'm really glad it was her. Keep listening to find out why I think Dr. Lee Crumpler should be known as the mother of modern gynecology instead of Dr. Sims from last week. So anyway, Jamal, that's pretty impressive what she's done. There must have been a lot of barriers in her path. Can you tell us more about how she grew up and then how she got into medicine? So Crumpler was born in Delaware, uh, but grew up in Pennsylvania, where she was raised by her aunt, who apparently was a healer and caretaker in their community. Crumpler credits this exposure in her book, A Book of Medical Discourse, as having an impact on her early interest in medicine. She says, having been reared by a kind aunt in Pennsylvania, whose usefulness with the sick was continually sought, I early conceived a liking for and sought every opportunity to be in a position to relieve the suffering of others. So Crumpler attended West Newton English Classical School in Massachusetts as a special student. What does uh, that mean? <laughs> I don't know what it means, but... Oh, she must have been pretty special, though. <laughs> yeah, so maybe it was a gifted student, but yeah. this term special student came up in a few different sources huh. during this research. 
uh, after high school, assuming this is after high school, some of this information is there's some gaps in connection. Yeah. But she worked as a nurse in Charleston, Massachusetts from 1852 to 1860. However, nurses at this time didn't have any real formal training, um, as the first nursing school didn't even open until 1873. But Crumpler showed a natural talent for medicine and was recommended by physicians to the New England Female Medical College in 1860. So she must have been pretty amazing, especially because, of course, the reason why we're doing this episode, there were no black women doctors at the time. Oh, yeah. I mean, the fact that they saw something in her to actually say you should go to medical school, whoever these, we don't actually know much. There's not really much information behind what they saw in her that recommended her for the job as a doctor, but I imagine she must have been, had an amazing natural talent for medicine for them to pick out this woman who normally wouldn't go to medical school and say, yeah, you've got to apply. In 1860, out of 54,543 doctors in the United States, 300 were women, which is half of a percent, and zero, zero were black women. So this was not common at all. Yeah, exactly. So in 1860, uh, Crumpler attended the New England Female Medical College. When she graduated in 1864, Crumpler was the first African-American woman in the United States to earn an MD degree and the only African-American woman to graduate from the New England Female Medical College until its merger with Boston University in 1873. That's incredible. And you read up on this school, right? The New England Female Medical College? Yeah, so this school was founded by doctors Israel Tisdale Talbot. <laughs> Say it three times fast. <laughs> Said it. And uh, Samuel Gregory in 1848 and accepted his first class of 12 women in 1850. The inspiration to create this university stemmed from women physicians not being permitted to attend medical lectures at existing medical programs. The one founder, Samuel Gregory, deemed it unnatural that men exclusively deliver babies and felt that women should be trained to become certified midwives. He also argued that the U.S. was the only country in the world that solely relied on men for the aid in childbirth. U.S. exceptionalism, huh? (laughs) I guess so. (laughs) He also believed that just in general, that women aiding in childbirth or conducting childbirth would reduce complications that men just weren't as skilled in recognizing. Yeah, that makes sense to me, especially considering what we learned last week about how men at this time were barely trained in any sort of female-specific medicine. And actually, Dr. Crumpler herself recognized the special advantage of women's experience. And I'll get to that later when we discuss the book that she wrote. There was a little bit of pushback on this idea, though. Um, Actually, one of the faculty members at the college, Dr. Maria, uh, here we go, you ready for another one? Yeah. Uh, Zekriska. Did I say it right? I have no idea. Yeah, you don't know. (laughs) I do have that special tongue, though. (laughs) Allegedly. Uh, Yeah, that definitely didn't sound right. (laughs) The listeners have no context of why you have a special tongue. Uh, Supposedly, I pronounce... um, things in different languages better than Jamal. <laughs> yeah, allegedly. <laughs> so so anyway, so one of the faculty members, she argued that women should practice medicine out of interest and passion for science and medicine, uh, not just empathy for women and children. Of course, there were other objections, uh, many by men who said that women could not endure what it takes to practice medicine or were intellectually incapable completing the curriculum. So they kind of thought that the New England Female Medical College was a big joke and that women wouldn't be trained properly at this institution. Yeah, I can't say I'm surprised at all, unfortunately. And let me tell you, like some prominent people still explicitly say very sexist things like this. Um, One thing that comes to mind off the top of my head is James Watson, one of the recipients of the Nobel Prize for the discovery of DNA. Have you heard about how awful he is? Yes, I have. Kind of racist, sexist, yep. anti-Semitic, etc. You can. I'm sure we'll discuss that much more when we talk about Rosalind Franklin, who was the woman who famously did not get enough credit for this discovery. She didn't. Yeah. Uh, she's known for Photo 51. Mm-hmm. I yeah. believe so. So I can't wait to talk about I that. I know. In a yeah. Episode. I'm sure we will soon. Yeah. So anyhow. With regards to this early women's medical college, 
I read a newspaper article from the Boston Globe in 1948, so it had a very long title. Female Medical College of 100 years ago had two professors and not even a skeleton. Colon, girl students called indelicate when BU's medical school opened. And this was written by Mary O'Brien. What, was that an abstract or the title? I know, right? I feel like I already know what the article was about. Seriously, I think it, the title was longer than the article itself. <laughs> but yeah, so um, she wrote this article to commemorate the 100th anniversary of the school's opening in 1848. And in the article, it also discusses how women were considered too delicate or unable to get around enough to become physicians. Which sounds a little bit like projection to me, but yeah, I don't even know what that means. Unable to get around. <laughs> I know. Seriously. Like walk. I think so. <laughs> okay. And they had a lot of trouble getting funding from this. What this article said, because male physicians didn't want to tarnish their reputation by donating to a women's school. Oh, the horror! So at first, it was just held in the houses of some doctors, and they didn't even have a real building. But it did have some success in Boston because the city had strong women's rights and abolitionist movements. So it made it actually a pretty good spot for this pioneering school. And as you said, they were only open for like 20 years, I think. But they, in that time, they did open a 12-bed women's and children's hospital, which was the largest in the country at that time. So that's um, not much to shake a stick at. But is that how you use that expression? I've never heard. I don't have the special tongue, so I'm not familiar with the phrase. Anyway, we're just going to move on. (laughs) So then, as you mentioned, it merged with Boston University in 1873 and became a co-ed school. Um, So people of all genders, after originally being considered by Harvard as just a women's school. So go be you for taking it over. Yeah. Mm Mm-hmm. And Jamal, you said that there were some other notable graduates you came across from this school. Yeah, so I have kind of looked into to see like what other people, uh, what other women um, physicians were produced or graduated, I should say, um, before the merger with BU. And I came across two women um, that were exceptionally interested. And one is Dr. Mary Harris Thompson, who founded the Chicago Hospital for Women and Children. Mm-hmm. And another one, Another woman is Dr. Esther Jane Hawks, an army surgeon who founded a school that educated newly freed slaves. And Mm. I hope we can cover her in a future episode because her story is also really interesting. Absolutely. That sounds awesome. Megan, uh, you were pretty interested in Crumpler's career after graduating, right? Can you tell us uh, what she used her medical degree for? Yeah. So I think that what she did after earning her MD was even more impressive than being the first black woman to earn it in the first place. So side note, MD stands for Medicine Doctor in Latin. Um, you said that wrong. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we'll just go with Doctor of Medicine in English. <laughs> but the funny thing that I, I thought this was funny, Dr. Crumpler refers to herself as a doctress of medicine in her book, like the female version of doctor. Uh, Which to me sounds really offensive, right? Like doctors of medicine. <laughs> but yeah, that would not fly today. So please never call me a doctress, Jamal. <laughs> <laughs> but, but actually, um, so you said MD stands for medicine doctor mm-hmm. or something like that. And the discipline for MD is allopathic medicine. Yeah. Right? That's, that's right. With the MD for versus. In the US, yeah. I don't know about in other countries. And then, but we also have DO degrees. Yes. And that's also, they are also physicians in the US, which stands for what? Doctor of Osteopathy. Okay. Yeah. So they are both. So the physician that you see might be either an MD or a DO. Both have gone to four years of medical school. They've probably gone to a residency. The only real difference is people who go to a DO school traditionally learned more homeopathic methods of treatment so more like body manipulation i guess yeah so they learn like massage therapy and stuff like that but <laughs> are you sure it's massage therapy <laughs> i don't really know i go to you're an gonna allopathic have some, school you're gonna have some VOs coming after you talking about we're not masseuses here so. all right i said it was a very minor part and also historical <laughs> our really good friend is at a 
yeah. school right now. Yeah, I know a couple so, of people. Wait till he hears school. this episode. Yeah. <laughs> He's dropping out. He doesn't want to be a masseuse. <laughs> yeah, so <laughs> back then, though, I don't know if they had dingoes yet. So I am not actually a expert on the history of MD versus DO, but maybe we can look that up sometime. Yeah. So anyway, you can imagine that Dr. Crumpler dealt with a whole lot of vitriol while working as a physician for the double outrage of being black and a woman. How dare she? How dare. How dare she? So this included being taunted that MD stood for other things, such as mule driver, so clever. So yeah, yeah, people are so good. Yeah, wow, yeah. haha, very funny. But from what we know, um, she dealt with all of that with grace, even when it meant that her prescriptions weren't being filled by the white pharmacists. Yeah, I read that. Yeah, I read that. I, I can only imagine the kind of hate that she received. Me too. And you know, she like barely touches on it in her book. It seems like she's just the type of person who just rose above it and just did what she was meant to do and didn't let it affect her. So. She was pretty amazing. Yeah, I think a lot of us young uh, trainees in uh, the biomedical science and medicine can adapt this uh, sort of resilience and mm-hmm. thick skin. Uh, I, I mean, just from my experience, I found that I can sleep well when I stand up for myself and what I believe in and mm-hmm. call out things that are wrong. But I also know that I cannot allow my conscious of things happening to derail me from um, the ultimate goal. I know. So, yeah, I think she's someone um, who who had to have this type of uh, resiliency to yeah. to make it forward. I agree, and it seems like she's the type of person who picked her battles, and she did good things, and she really worked for the betterment of society. But when it came to the personal injustice against her, she was able to rise above it. So, yeah, I mean, incredible. As an aside, you know. It's no secret that there is a lack of uh, representation amongst um, black physicians in the workforce and mm-hmm. black faculty members at medical schools. We see reports about this all the time. And even in those individuals, I, I wonder you know, how much pressure they feel maybe being one of a few only faculty members of yeah. the pressure if you fail or if you are not, if you don't rise above, like mm-hmm. how you will look at like the weight that you have to carry. Yes. But Dr. Crumpler was the first. Yeah. So can you imagine, like, how many people, how many naysayers were just waiting for her to fail? Oh, yeah. Yeah, And the pressure that she must have had to say, I'm the first person ever to do this. Yeah. When did she start school? 1860? 1860. Slavery hadn't even been abolished yet. Uh Uh-huh. So, and to think, I need to do this and I Mm -hmm. need to, to do it gracefully. And she did it, which is, you know, essentially why we're doing this episode. Oh, Yeah. Yeah, I, I'm just so impressed by her, and I think everyone should know about her. So, <laughs> so yeah, like, when she got her MD, she did not just get it for the good pay and then turn to practicing comfortably. She devoted her entire career to helping the poorest among the nation, and usually people of her own race and sex, because she knew the, uni- the unique struggles they faced, and she wanted to be the person who could help them. So after graduating in 1865, Dr. Crumpler worked first in Boston, and like I said, she was caring primarily for African-American women and their children. Accounts tell us that she really, she just wanted to treat people. She just wanted to heal people. She didn't care much about their ability to pay, like she would treat them regardless. She just sincerely wanted to do what she could to help. And then in 1865, The Civil War had just ended. Four million people were transitioning from being enslaved to free. And you can imagine they had a lot of needs that weren't being met, including health care. So Dr. Crumpler decided the ideal spot for missionary work, in her words, was in Richmond, Virginia, working with the Freedmen's Bureau. Wow. So I would like you to talk more about what the Freedmen's Bureau is. Because was it some sort of charity? Uh, but before you answer that, I actually wanted to touch on something that you said about like her desire to work with individuals that she could more relate to mm-hmm. that uh, from more disadvantaged communities. Mm-hmm. Um, if we do the math, what was this uh, over 150 years mm-hmm. ago? Yeah. Um, I actually was looking at some statistics the other day from the AAMC. Do you know what it stands for? Yeah, American Association of Medical Colleges. Yes. So I was looking at the data that they had collected. Mm-hmm. And just kind of scrolling through some charts, and one statistic I came across was that 
when you look at medical students and residents and where they their selected specialty that they want to work in, I think whites were like 25 percent of white students wanted to work in like underserved communities. But Black and Hispanic was somewhere above like 60%. Wow. So even still today, we have the people who who are coming from these underserved mm-hmm. communities taking less pay and less prestige yeah. to go back and work for those underserved uh, communities right. as opposed to, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this is the motivation for all people wanting to go into like surgery or things like that. But even though it is very competitive, but instead of wanting to go for how can I find a specialty that makes the most money mm-hmm. and have the most prestige, it's more like how can I give back and yeah. service the community? So I just wanted to add that as an aside for what you were talking about. With Absolutely. Dr. Yeah, that's still so important today. And I think... I think you got some more stats for us at the end of the episode that we'll get yeah, into. Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm all about the stats. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but first, yeah, so what's this uh, Freedmen's Bureau? So this was a governmental organization, actually under the U.S. War Department, for some reason, Okay. that was supposed to help these 4 million newly freed people get on their feet during Reconstruction. But this organization, I mean, surprise, surprise, from what we know of history, was poorly funded and had little support among Southerners. No one is shocked. And it essentially just handed power back to the former slave owners and left the formerly enslaved with next to nothing. Well, we did have a conversation with Dr. Henry Lewis Taylor, a professor of urban studies at the University of Buffalo. Um, He discussed what he calls uh, the Great Betrayal, where Mm -hmm. the U.S. government just returned power to the Confederate traitors instead of to free slaves who had an essential part in helping the Union win the war in the first place. So really, the only punishment these former slave owners had was that they could no longer own humans like livestock. Otherwise, conditions were pretty much the same. Jeez. Yeah, it's it's so horrifying when you think about it. And when he phrased it like that to to us when we were having this conversation yeah it really struck me because that's like that's not how you learn about it in history it's just like oh of course like the slave owners got their land back and they got everything back and then the former slaves just went to work on their land as like quote employees instead of slaves but it was essentially still a form of bondage yeah it's it's not the case at all yeah Yeah, it's not the case of we talked about this last episode of what we learned in uh, traditional form of education. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, of course. So the fact that this Freedmen's Bureau had no teeth was due to the Democrats at the time, who were the conservatives of the day. Yeah, the party s- switched platforms in the mid 20th century. <laughs> so I don't know if you know more about that. No, I just put that. In. Okay. <laughs> I know Dixie Kratz and you know all those yeah, things. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but I, mm-hmm. I'm not an expert in. Oh, see, I just uh, expect you to be an expert of all things politics. Yeah, no, uh, <laughs> not that. It kind of, I kind of lost my political science professor as an undergraduate. Be, be disappointed in me. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay, but anyway, these people quickly defunded the organization for fear that it would make former slaves lazy. Does that sound familiar at all to today? <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> So um, while the Bureau was around, these newly free people were, like I said, they were just encouraged to work under their former masters, supposedly as employer and employed rather than master and slave, but this barely changed their living conditions. And black women were notably treated very differently than white women of the time. Instead of being considered delicate and in need of protection, Freed women were punished for not being employed as field hands alongside their families. And the Freedmen Bureau actually pushed husbands to sign contracts for the wives, making wow. me wonder how much of their bondage actually ended when the war was over. Wow. Did, did any real good come from this Freedmen's Bureau then? From what I've read, not much. But okay. one of the major lasting accomplishments was education. So, I mean, that is pretty... Awesome. Many schools were established, and although they did lose funding later, it created a standard for education among African Americans. One inspector for the for the bureau, J. W. Alvord, wrote that people were really excited to learn. The freedmen have the natural thirst for knowledge, aspire to power and influence, coupled with learning, and are excited by the special study of books. So I guess. They were just human beings. Like, okay. <laughs> I yeah. think he was just surprised, but whatever. 
<laughs> so this legacy influenced the formation of historically black colleges and universities, which were spaces for higher education of black people in the South at this time when they weren't permitted in all white institutions. And actually, one of the most famous of these schools, Howard University in D.C., is named for the Freedmen's Bureau Commissioner, General Oliver Otis Howard. So, a white guy. <laughs> yeah. But uh, Howard University is, you know, still really responsible for the majority of graduate, medical school graduates of uh, Black or African American descent. Yeah. Even though the numbers are pretty low, mm -hmm. most of them are concentrated at um, Howard University. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, so that legacy at least remains strong. Yeah. So... What role did Dr. Crumpler play in the Freedmen's Bureau? So after the Civil War, the freed slaves were denied care by most of the white physicians in the South. The hectic conditions, I mean, basically just being thrown on the streets with no land, no money, no nothing. In these impoverished, crowded environments, it caused a lack of sanitation and easy spread of disease. So you can think of newly freed people as refugees. Really. I mean, to me, like their ancestors were taken from their home country and then they were just left with people who didn't want them there in the country that they had been kidnapped to. So they were really refugees. Yeah. And so gaining adequate health care was really hard to come by and really important. And so Dr. Crumpler worked with this organization and she specifically cared for the women and children. In her book, she says, quote, after the close of the Confederate War, which I thought was interesting. She didn't call it the Civil War. She mm. called it the Confederate War. Okay. My mind centered around Richmond, the capital set city of Virginia, as the proper field for real missionary work, and one that would present ample opportunities to become acquainted with the diseases of women and children. During my stay there, nearly every hour was improved in that sphere of labor. Yeah, so I don't know much about the Freedmen's Bureau specifically, but I do remember learning about the Reconstruction period. I know at the time, Andrew Johnson was the president, and he opposed the Reconstruction mm -hmm. and those efforts. So Freedmen's Bureau might have been one of those it initiatives. Was, yeah. was it? Yeah. yeah. Uh, of course, he's the first president to ever be impeached. Yeah. So, <laughs> and rightfully so, um, which is actually pretty satisfying because, you know, we talked last week about uh, J. Miriam Sims, mm -hmm. and a lot of his defenders were saying like he was just a product of, of his time. But actually, there were a lot of people fighting for the rights of enslaved people and, yeah. and in slavery and mm -hmm. Reconstruction. And a lot of these people were white people, yeah. that, uh, abolitionists that mm -hmm. were fighting for it. So, yeah, Andrew Johnson got impeached. Yeah. And um, I, I do know the most memorable component of his presidency for me, from what I remember reading, is that his kind of suppressive... Uh, nature towards the Reconstruction period. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. I mean, saying someone's a product of, the t of their time is the dumbest excuse to me. Like, you could say Donald Trump is a product of our time because he is, because he was elected president in our time. Yeah. But that doesn't excuse his actions at it, all. Yeah, so. yeah it, it, doesn't, it doesn't excuse it. And mm -hmm. especially because some of the same people who consider slavery as just a product of its time mm -hmm. are also some of the same people who love our founding fathers. Yeah. You know, I, I'm not going to lie. Our founding fathers were very smart. Mm -hmm. They were brilliant in some ways and they um, sort of remediated some of their mistakes that they made before the Revolutionary War mm -hmm. with the um, Articles of Confederation and really figured out how to make this a unified country. So these were very, very intelligent men and they specifically and intentionally chose to keep people enslaved mm -hmm. after the Revolutionary War. Mm -hmm. After they cried out to the rest of the world, to France, that they were being abused and by the British and their inalienable rights were jeopardized, yeah. they still kept slaves for 90 years oh, yeah. after the freedom of this country. Huge so, hypocrites. Yeah, I mean, this isn't a slide, but this is why, even till now, some people still feel that the 4th of July, Independence Day, is like not their holiday. So yeah, I don't feel like that. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, I mean, these were really smart people. So mm -hmm. it's just going back to a product of your time. Mm -hmm. You know, you got to pick one. Were they, were they bad, I know. uneducated people or were they smart people who knew exactly what they were doing? Exactly. I mean, if you think about women too, John Adams' wife was continually telling him, remember the women, remember the ladies. Like, yeah. we need freedom too. Women were not 
women were just under the control of their husband for all intents and purposes, or their father, or whatever man was in their life. So they knew that, like, this was a different kind of lack of rights, but same thing. Like, they knew that people wanted these things to change. Yes. And chose not to. Chose not to do it. It wasn't Mm -hmm. just everybody was in a trance and, Mm -hmm. you know, (laughs) this, this, you know, there there were still people who advocated from Mm -hmm. the beginning of this country to make it a more fair place. Yeah. And uh, people who oppose slavery. Mm-hmm. So, but anyway, so Megan, this book that you're referring to of Dr. Crumpler's a book on medical discord, right? Mm-hmm. Were there any particular things in there that you gleaned from this? And what was the major takeaways? Because I didn't read this book. Yeah. So I didn't read the whole thing, but I did skim through a lot of it and read a good amount. So this may be the first medical book by an African-American author, according to an article in PBS NewsHour. So pretty awesome. And I found the book, which was published in 1883, really interesting. Um, I can't say I would recommend it as a reference for healthcare today, because (laughs) the advice is about 140 years old, but the way she wrote it really struck me. The opening words of the introduction are, I now present to the public a few thoughts in book book form, trusting that they will be accepted on their merits alone. The following pages contain a few simple appeals to common sense and are addressed to mothers, nurses, and women generally. And I would say this book and the intent behind it is pretty revolutionary. It was written by a professionally trained woman physician, specifically for the average woman to take care of herself and her children. And apparently just the fact that she introduced the book for herself was unique for the time. Because forwards or intros of books written by anyone other than a white man were often written by such a man just to lend credibility so that people would buy it, which... Is gross, but wow. <laughs> so Dr. Crumpler is just like, nah, I know what I'm talking about. She didn't care about that elite elitism. She just wanted to get this knowledge to the general public. Again, the resilience. I mean, you said earlier that she couldn't even get prescriptions passed. Yeah, that she wrote. So mm-hmm. this is a whole. Uh, was she all it in book form? A uh, yeah. article in book form? Yeah. <laughs> so a few thoughts in yeah, book she form. just didn't care. Like, I know. You, <laughs> you know, if you if you don't care what she has to say, then fine. Yeah. Um, She's just like a few appeals to common sense. <laughs> <laughs> so, what kind of knowledge did she want to get to the general public? So, through this book, she was drawing on her her own direct experience through her decades worth of extensive notes she took while practicing as a doctor. Mm-hmm. So one of the first things she discusses is how to keep a mother comfortable and safe during labor, how to humanely ensure the health of the newborn baby and make their entrance into the world pleasant. Like she says, you should warm the baby instead of just dousing them with cold water to promote circulation, which apparently they were doing. That's what they did? Yeah, they're just like dunking a newborn baby in like cold water to like wake it up. I don't know. And she's like, please stop doing that. Like just make the baby comfortable and like make this less traumatic for everyone. So maybe Dr. Gregory was on to something like we need women in here to like something's not right. Like we're baptizing babies in cold water. Like Like a minute after they've been born. Yeah, we need to innovate a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. And they were also giving them like alcohol and camphor, I don't know how to say it, camphor oil and like other like substances that we know are really toxic for babies. What do you mean they were giving it to them? Like giving it to babies to make them stop crying and stuff, like feeding it to them. Wow. Yeah. So Dr. Crumpler is like, please stop doing that. (laughs) Well, I do remember actually in an analytical toxicology class I took when I was doing my master's, seeing an ad by aspirin for like cocaine with children on the cover of it. An ad by aspirin? Yeah. Aspirin's not a brand. No, I mean not aspirin. What is it? (laughs) Bear. Bear. Yeah. Whatever. (laughs) The aspirin's just dancing around. (laughs) Yeah, the aspirin. Take coke. (laughs) Do coke. Bear. I've seen an ad by Bear where... um, they were advertising like heroin and oh uh, cocaine for like yeah. tooth pain and it was just oh like over the counter. God. Yeah, it's like it's it's one picture that's like still stuck in my mind because the place was in um in Albany and it's like these two kids on a cover with like cocaine drops. So Yikes. yeah. Yeah. We came a long way. I know, right? Yeah. yeah. In this book, she's basically advocating for like more um like natural treatment and um, healthier, not just like shoving random home medicines down the baby's throats. And anyway, the way that she really made 
She really emphasized the health of the woman and the baby. This stood out to me in direct contrast to the way that the so-called father of gynecology, Dr. Sims, treated women. Okay. Because he didn't care, as we learned last week, he didn't care one bit for their pain. He didn't care about their comfort. But yeah. Dr. Crumpler, she knew that there was a different approach to childbirth between the different genders at this time. So, like, she directly says how the male physicians at that time would leave the woman soon after birth in the care of ex inexperienced family members. But the women physicians stayed longer to ensure better outcomes. And then throughout the book, she just writes about sickness and normal function and normal anatomy in a way that's really accessible to all kinds of people, even with varying health literacy. So I think I know what you're going to say, but uh, <laughs> you kind of alluded to this earlier. Why exactly do you think Dr. Rebecca Lee Crumpler should be considered the mother of minor gynecology instead of us having the father, James Marion Sims? The godfather. The godfather. <laughs> it's your man. I'm confused now. Was he the godfather? Was he, he was a stepdaddy, <laughs> right? The stepdaddy of gynecology. I think that's what we finally settled on. But uh, are you saying that, seriously, are you saying that there should be a push now that we refer to Rebecca Lee Crumpler as the mother of yeah, gynecology? I am saying that because in so many ways, she just really clearly cares about the women and the babies under her care. She just always was emphasizing their health and the natural treatment mm. instead of just jumping to these invasive cures like Sim was, Sims, and is reassuring mothers that babies progress at different rates, so don't worry too much, and really empowering women to understand the basics of health and disease for themselves instead of just relying on the doctor to tell them what's wrong. And she's, in this book, she's discussing normal functions like breastfeeding in such a matter-of-fact way she just refers to female anatomy in a way that's not shaming, it's not hush-hush. Mm -hmm. This, I think, was really unusual for the times when, like, the male doctors weren't even looking at the yeah. women's anatomy. Yeah. So, <laughs> And that's what a good physician does, in my mind. They work with the patient to educate them on maintaining their own health. Instead of simply scribbling up a prescription and sending them on their way, this person can then take care of themselves um, with the doctor's help and education. So Dr. Crumpler gives so many tips on like how the mother can alleviate her own pain and her own discomfort. So she took care of the mother as a person instead of simply an instrument of childbearing like Sims did. So that's so much more reflective of gynecology today. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, I didn't read was it a book on medical discourse. Mm -hmm. I didn't read this, but just listening to you talk now, and I remember doing a research on Sims, mm -hmm. and he also had an autobiography. Mm. It's completely different. Like, <laughs> even in their own words, in mm -hmm. his own words, he wanted to let you know what he did, yeah. what he invented, uh -huh. uh, not necessarily like this is what you can do right. to advance the field. Yeah, and this book that Dr. Crumpler wrote, the introduction has, like, that one paragraph about her that we read about the beginning, where yeah. she's like, yeah, my aunt was a caretaker, and that mm -hmm. inspired me. And that's it. And then the rest of it is about what you can do for your own health. Wow. She was such a selfless person who was really in it just for the care of other people. It's like she really just embodied the best qualities of a physician. She specifically discusses in a really straightforward way that poor mothers should receive the same care as the wealthy. And we know she lived this truth in her work, treating anyone even if they couldn't pay. She also encourages men and women of her race, as she says, so presumably African-American, mm -hmm. to take good care of themselves and look after their health. And this wasn't something that was really emphasized at that time. Wow, that's that's truly amazing. I, I think I'm on board with you. Yeah. Uh, so, okay, <laughs> listeners, we want to start the plug for Rebecca Lee Crumpler to be the mother, mother of gynecology. Oh, yeah. yeah. Get it trending on Twitter. <laughs> so I don't know who we, I don't know. in charge of the social book of media. mothers and fathers <laughs> of uh, specific, you know, specific titles. But, mm -hmm. um, yeah, I, I would like to see that. Yeah. Yeah. So what? Sims had, like, I don't know, I'm just guessing from the research that we did, maybe like eight statues or something yeah. like that that were up. He even had a statue up in France from treating, like, an empress over there for oh my gosh. some issue. So do we have a statue of Rebecca Lee Crumpler? Because actually, like, I've seen some images of her, but that might not have even been her. And I've read in yeah. various publications that there is no known photograph. Yeah, so, I read that too. Yeah, so 
Is there a statue at least? Or, no, or something? there's or... nothing. Up until until July 2020, so this was last month, up until last month, mm-hmm. she didn't even have a gravestone. There was nothing marking her grave. What? She was in an unmarked grave in the Fairview Cemetery in Boston. Oh, my God. Yeah. Okay. And, like, no one knows anything about her. We didn't know about her until I Googled who was the first black woman to earn an MD, and her name popped up. And then we were like, this is an awesome woman. But so in July 2020, according to a Boston Globe article, efforts by Dr. Melody McLeod, who is an OBGYN at Emory University Hospital and who graduated from Boston University herself, along with Vicki Gell, the president of the Friends of Hyde Park Library, the two of them, with the efforts of others, dedicated a gravestone to Rebecca and her second husband, Arthur Crumpler, because, like I said, there was nothing there. Like, you couldn't even go and visit her grave. Sims has all these statues that you discussed. So, yeah, and defenders of these yeah. statues, saying that we need these statues so that enslaved women can get credit for their right. contributions. Mm-hmm. Um, or, or something like that. It's, it's some twisted logic. Yeah. Meanwhile, we don't even have a statue of Dr. Crumpler. You didn't even no. have a gravestone? Yes. Oh, my God. That, you know, it's, it's interesting that you mentioned Dr. Melody McLeod, the OBGYN, who, from memory, right? Yeah. Yeah, I actually read that, you know, you said she put, she created some type of, uh, what did she create at BU? Oh, so she created a permanent exhibit about her at BU in 2016. And she also encouraged the governor of Virginia to dedicate a day to her. I don't know what came of that. Yeah, if we have that day. Yeah, I don't know. But I do remember reading, though, that when she went to BU, Dr. McLeod, she actually had never even heard of Rebecca Lee Crumpler. Mm -hmm. Remember, guys, Boston University is the college that Rebecca Lee Crumpler went to. That's what became the merger, Mm -hmm. uh, is BU. And this is a black woman who ended up going into... Here we go with this word. Obst- obstet- obstetrics. Yes, there you go. And gynecology. Mm-hmm. Um, yet never heard of Dr. Crumpler. Yeah. So, so Dr. McLeod is doing a great thing. I mean, she's also to... reclaiming the bench. She is reclaiming the bench. You know? Yeah, we should talk to her. Maybe she'll hear this. <laughs> yeah. Call us. Yeah. <laughs> Business at reclaimthebench.com. Call us on our email. <laughs> yeah, call us. Call us on our fax machine. (laughs) Our pagers. (laughs) And then um, additionally, the only other recognition that I could find is that there's a Rebecca Lee Society in Georgia. Lee was the last name of her first husband and Crumpler of her second husband. Also, side note, her first husband died while she was in medical school and she just like dealt with that and like pushed through. Yeah, like of tuberculosis. Yeah. Yeah, she still... Completed her medical degree in four years, yeah. from 1860 to 1864. Yeah, yeah. so yeah. she's just like, oh, such a badass. Oh, my God. And then there's also a pre-health organization at Syracuse University, which is named for her as well. Mm-hmm. So after having gone through what the conditions were like for black women 150 years ago, Jamal, what's it like today? How's the news? How are the stats? <laughs> yeah, so we're going to have our uh, stats le- lesson for this episode. Lay it so, on me. As you guys will get to know me, I really like history, the story behind the story, the story about the person, but I also mm-hmm. really like numbers and trends and what that tells us about a story, too. Mm-hmm. Uh, numbers are power if they're used right. Okay. Um, so I'll just run off some research that I did about the representation of women, African-American women, and African-Americans in general Mm -hmm. in uh, medical schools and as uh, working physicians. So today, for 2019-2020, that report from AAMC, which Mm -hmm. again stands for... American Association of Medical Colleges. Yes. (laughs) Uh, Are you quizzing me? (laughs) No, I really am bad with acronyms. (laughs) (laughs) So um, for the first time in this year, for for the latest report, women are the majority in medical school, Mm -hmm. uh, slightly, at um, 52.4%. So, Heck yeah. Yeah. And amongst these uh, 52.4% of women, only 8% of them are black, though. Ooh. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we should put reaction noises. <laughs> yeah. Jay, add that in there. Yeah, better than my heck yeah and my boo. <laughs> yeah, heck yeah. You sound like Stone Cold Steve Austin or somebody. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, but of these women, of this small uh, portion of African-American women medical students, 
they make up 62% of all African-American medical students. Mm. So while Black Americans, African Americans comprise, what, 13, 14% of the U.S. population, they make up total of only about 5% of the physician workforce. So which like is like a third of what they should be. Yeah, and almost a million physicians wow. in active workforce now. So roughly 32% of physicians are women, and wow. black women doctors represent, want to take a guess? Mm, I already read it, but uh, I hope it's better than half a percent. It's 2%. Oh, yay. Uh, so so we've, we've slightly moved the needle. Mm. And 39% of full-time faculty at medical schools are women. Again, of those women, only 4% of full-time faculty identify as Black, African American, Latino, or Hispanic, Native American, or Alaskan Native, or Native Hawaiian, or Pacific Islander. Mm. Wow. Total. All, all of those, all those people in oh the four, my god so if you're 4%. looking at the pie chart it's just like the other and the rest is yeah, like white exactly some asian so women have made strides in medicine and african-american women have made strides specifically mm-hmm. but the numbers are still very very small yeah and very actually small. you know so while the numbers are still low black women have continued to increase as black men have been declining um, in fact, one of the things I came across was that in 2014, there were less black slash African-American men enrolled in medical school than in 1978. Yikes. So unfortunately, it's not as though representation as a whole has increased for black medical students. It's just that we're losing black men and replacing those seats with black women. And again, I like to look at numbers. I like to look at mm-hmm. charts and it's very depressing. Um, yeah. I should have uh, pulled up some of these for you to look at, but it's pretty depressing to see a flat line. Yeah, That's where we're at. From the report I looked at from mm-hmm. AAMC from 1974 is when it started, the mm-hmm. report started, up to 2016. The line literally has not budged for African-American representation in medical school. It's we're, flat lines. We're still we're still not there. And we've only increased marginally from the 0.5% of black women physicians in a workforce that you talked about earlier in the episode yeah. uh, almost 160 years ago. Yeah. So 2%, mm-hmm. uh, it, it, it's just unacceptable. It, absolutely. It is unacceptable. And, like, from your experience, do you try to seek out physicians who are people of color? Definitely. And uh, it's not just me. And mm-hmm. It's not just me wanting to uh, promote people because of the color of our skin, mm-hmm. even though, you know, that's fine, too. But it's really because from my experience, I feel uh, those individuals know my body better. Mm-hmm. They know um, the external factors that weigh on healthcare and yeah. communities such as mine. Um, they have a more heightened focus uh, for people who look like them. Mm -hmm. Um, And overall, the bedside manner, the comfortability from my small experience Mm -hmm. with black or minority uh, physicians has has just been more uh, of a better experience. Yeah. But it's hard to find that. Yeah, Um, I imagine. Yeah. So I also looked at some other numbers. I didn't put that in the notes for this episode, but if I can remember correctly, most Black physicians are clustered in internal medicine and family medicine. Oh, mm. family medicine, then internal medicine, okay. then pediatrics. Mm. Now, to be fair, about every group has more weight in those specialties because they're probably less competitive, as you know, than something yeah. like neurosurgery or something like that. Right. But when you look at the opposite end of the scale, you know, although there's clusters for whites in those specialties, Mm -hmm. there's also a good amount of representation in more um, exclusive specialties Mm -hmm. like orthopedic surgery and things like that. And you really don't see that in the African-American physician population. And I don't know why. I I don't know is that if that's because competitively they have uh, forces that you know have prohibited them from going into those specialties, mm-hmm. or if they just choose to go into family medicine. But I do know, and uh, from looking at numbers and anecdotally, that for specialties like what you're going in, what you're going to go into, like psychiatry, mm-hmm. there's a huge demand for black psychiatrists. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Uh, because mental health in the black community uh, is something that kind of has its own uh, issues, but there's really not a lot of supply yeah. um, for individuals. Right. Mm-hmm. So. Yeah, we should talk about that in a future episode, how mental health is viewed and approached in different um, communities. Yeah, I would like to get uh, Dr. Damon Tweedy on the podcast mm, at yeah. some point, uh, he, who's a psychiatrist at Duke, mm-hmm. who wrote Black Man in a White Coat. Uh, yeah. I won't spoil it, but uh, I read that book a few years ago and really would like to talk to him now. about Dr. Tweedy, please call us at our fax machine. <laughs> yeah, call our fax. This is at thecleanthebench.com. <laughs> um, but what all that said about Black male physicians... Uh, or medical students declining. I would like to pay homage to one black male physician in particular, Dr. Charles Drew, who we mm-hmm. actually have a school named after him in Buffalo, New York. Oh, we do? Yep. No way. Yeah, it's uh, uh, connected with the Buffalo Science Museum. Cool. And actually, there's lots of schools around the country named after him. There might even be a medical university mm-hmm. named after uh, Dr. Charles Drew, who innovated blood storage for like military use and things like that during his time, and um, we'll be covering him next. Spoilers! Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Then, that's it. I just told you everything. So, do you have anything else to add? Nah, I mean, you all find your joy in this um, crazy time. Whatever makes you happy, whether it's gardening or baking or laying on the couch and watching Netflix, don't feel ashamed of whatever you have to do to get through isolation. Yeah. I'm going to garden and bake when I get home. No, you're not. <laughs> <laughs> and make white chili. <laughs> and eat white nectarines. <laughs> so, uh, and also let us know what you would like to hear. And um, we'll consider those topics for future episodes. Please. We are very open to feedback. And if we ever get anything wrong, it's okay to correct us. Yeah. Because it's we probably, know that we're not experts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's probably happened so yeah i'm sure uh so but we do try our best to report the most accurate um information that we can um and from just our last couple episodes you know these are historic events that you know some parts weren't as documented Mm -hmm. or the narrative was um controlled by those who wanted to promote people like sims but couldn't give a gravestone to rebecca lee crumpler so All right, we'll be talking about Charles Drew next. Peace. Crumpler. (laughs) Start over. Velveeta. No, start over your Rebecca Lee. (laughs) And also, don't forget to subscribe to Reclaim the Bench on Apple, Spotify, Google Play, or wherever you listen to podcasts. And if you like what you hear, leave a review. This is one of the best ways to support our mission of amplifying the voices of those silenced in scientific and medical discovery. For even more content, including exclusive interviews or a chance to chat with us live, become a Reclaim the Bench patron at Patreon. Follow us on social media. We're on Instagram and Twitter at Reclaim the Bench. Also, stop by ReclaimTheBench.com to see what's on the agenda and to leave comments or suggestions on what topics you'd like to see us cover next. And if you'd like to further support our podcast, you can donate through our website. Funds will help us to maintain the infrastructure necessary to continue delivering you content.